So thank you all for coming. I really appreciate your interest. And that says something about where mindfulness and, and Buddhism is in our culture now. Uh, so I think it's, we've entered another, uh, another place where uh, people are really interested for their, own, uh, for their own selves or for the benefit of people that they care about. Um, as Lonnie said, I have a new book that's out there, Advice Not Given. The subtitle is A Guide to Getting Over Yourself. And um, I'm not going to read you bits from the book uh, tonight, uh, as I sometimes do on you know, book tour kinds of things. But I'm going to try to present you with some of the background uh, inspiration uh, that led me to writing the book. So I have a, a kind of a collage of material that I, that I want to give to you. Uh, with an overarching theme of like an introduction to Buddhist psychology that has really influenced me. Uh, for those of you who are not so familiar with my work, uh, I am a psychiatrist, which means I went to medical school. Most of what I do is one-on-one uh, -on -one psychotherapy with uh, adult patients in my office in Lower Manhattan. Uh, I've written a number of books, uh, all of them written one day a week. So it takes a few years for a book to accumulate, but that, that way of writing a little bit every week has allowed me to unfurl my, my thoughts about, uh, uh, about things. Um, I had the, uh, I think, special and unusual, and I would say fortunate experience of learning about Buddhism uh, academically and also experientially uh, before I really was educated about uh, anything else. Uh, I found Buddhism in my first semester undergraduate at college uh, when I happened upon an introduction to world religion class, which I wasn't planning on taking, but I met someone who was taking it and I thought, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, ended up in the class and the entire first semester was about Eastern religion and the um, material about Buddhism seemed particularly resonant and relevant uh, to me. And I followed a, a, um, uh, an indirect path uh, coming upon uh, various uh, teachers, scholars, experts in Buddhism for the next seven, eight years, um, along the way resolving to uh, 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 go to medical school with the idea of becoming a psychiatrist and so on. Uh, but a lot of my work since then has been integrating what I learned from Buddhism with what I later came to learn from Western psychology, Western psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, and psychiatry. And my earlier books were primarily, the way I think of them now, uh, they were attempts on my part to translate Buddhist thought into the Western psychological language that's like the common language that we all speak. Uh, from my study of, uh, of uh, Buddhist history, uh, Buddhism started 2,500 years ago in uh, what's now India. It migrated all over Asia, never by force of a conquering army, but always by the force of its ideas. And uh, every time that it moved into a new culture, it had to be retranslated into the ideology uh, or the religion or uh, of wherever it was going. So when it went to China, it sort of merged with the Taoist thought that was already there and morphed into what we think of as Zen. Uh, similarly, in Korea and Japan and Tibet, Southeast Asia and so on. Uh, now that it's come here, there's this integration that's possible, I think, with uh, uh, psychoanalytic thought, uh, which more than any single religion in our culture, I think, sort of has uh, uh, colonized the way we think about the mind. Um, this last book, uh, I, uh, came the idea for it, I think, came uh, originally uh, nine years ago when uh, my father, who was then 84, uh, was diagnosed with a brain tumor, a malignant brain tumor, the, the same sort that uh, uh, Edward Kennedy and now John McCain uh, ha, uh, has been diagnosed with. So it was a malignant tumor uh, 
uh, by the time my father discovered it, it had already traveled through his brain and there was nothing much to do about it. Uh, my father was a scientist, a researcher, an academic physician, first at Yale and then at Harvard, who never uh, uh, was that interested in anything spiritual. Um, he was very uh, glad that I went to medical school, which he had always wanted and I had kind of resisted for a while. Um, and he was proud of my books and had them all in his office, but we never had much of a discussion about you know, the heart of, uh, of Buddhist thought or anything. He wasn't that interested, I didn't think he was that interested. Um, and uh, it, there was never really an opportunity to, excuse me, to talk about it. Uh, the brain tumor, when it was discovered, my father was still working, he was 84, uh, but and it came on the non-dominant side of his brain, so it only affected uh, balance and his sense of direction. So it really wasn't discovered until he was driving home from the hospital in Brookline to the, you know, the same 15 minute drive that he'd taken for 30 years, but he got lost on the way home and then knew something was wrong. And because it was on the non-dominant side of his brain, cognitively, uh, in, in, intellectually, he was still himself and continued to work until he couldn't, and he knew what was happening. Uh, so he knew that he would die fairly, fairly soon, as did I. So um, I, I remember a moment when I was sitting in my office, which is in the basement of the building that we live in in Lower Manhattan, uh, and, uh, and I realized what I told you already, oh, I've never really had a discussion with my father about what everything that I've learned, if I have learned anything from my study of mindfulness and meditation and Buddhism and the Tibetan Book of the Dead and what happens life to life if you want to uh, think about things that way. So I decided that I would pick up the phone and call my dad and tell him, you know, like, if you want to know, here's what they say might happen uh, when, uh, when, it, when death comes. Uh, so I did, and he was very receptive. Uh, he's like, oh, nice to hear from you, and, you know. Uh, and I said, you know, I don't know if you want to uh, hear this from me, but I feel I'll feel badly if we never have this discussion, because maybe it would be helpful. And I tried to find non-Buddhist um, uh, language to talk to him about it in, because he's basically a scientific materialist, like most of us, and didn't, you know, thought, thinks that when he thought that when he died, he was just going to die. But he was willing to have the conversation. Um, so I said to him something like, uh, "You know that feeling that's deep inside, where you know who you are." that feels the same from when you were 20 to when you were 40 to when you were 60 to when you were 80, like the body changes, but inside you don't really change that much in terms of your subjective perception of yourself. At least that's my experience of myself. Um, I said, but if, you know, when you tune into that feeling, it's kind of an invisible thing. You can't really put your finger on it and say, oh, that's who I am, and yet, subjectively, you know, from the point of view of consciousness, you kind of know. And it's, there's a distinct feeling. You're not, you know, I'm not you and you're not me. Uh, um, I, I'm me, right? So we could get lost in that for a while. Um, but I said that to my dad. I, I said what the, what the Buddhists say is that uh, you can learn to relax your mind into that kind of invisible space as the body shuts down and you can ride that feeling out uh, as you die. And he was very nice. He said, okay, darling, I'll try. <laughs> and I think that was basically the last real conversation that, that we had. Um, so that was the first hint of, you know, advice that I'd been holding back and not giving, but that, you know, felt, uh, uh, empowered to offer. And uh, then some years later, I was on a silent meditation retreat, which is something that I try to give myself every, every year if I can, although uh, when my wife and I had our two children, 11 years went by uh, uh, between one retreat and the next. But uh, when I went back after 11 years, it was like as if no time had passed. The experience was right there to be 
uh, accessed again, which I found very reassuring. But so since that time, I've tried to go every year or two. And I was some number of days into the retreat. Um, these retreats, you don't talk, and the idea is to bring mindful awareness to every moment of the day as much as possible. So you alternate sitting meditation with walking meditation, with eating meditation, with taking a nap meditation, or uh, uh, you know whatever else you're doing. Um, and I was sitting in meditation and thinking about the conversation with my father, I think, and also feeling grateful to be having the experience and reflecting on some of my patients and how I uh, was always careful not to preach Buddhism to them, but instead to um, uh, uh, relate as a classic therapist, you know, waiting to see what they were bringing and uh, uh, paying attention to that rather than uh, trying to teach them mindfulness or uh, teach them about Buddhist psychology, as I'm going to do tonight to you. Um, but I started to think, oh, maybe for, for my patients who I care about so much, uh, there's advice I've not been giving also. Uh, I've gotten so much from this, but I'm kind of keeping it, even though I've written all these books and so on, in the day-to-day, -day, I'm kind of keeping it back. And then... Um, uh, although I was supposed to be meditating, that phrase of uh, advice I'm not giving, I was like, oh, that could be a good title for a book, uh, advice not given, and I you know, scribbled it down in my little notebook. Um, so then I, then I set out to um, uh, let that be a kind of guiding uh, force in writing this book, which I tried to write from a position of oh, I've actually been a therapist now for 30, 30 odd years, working with people day by day. And I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to write about what it's like to have a Buddhist sensibility uh, influencing the way that I work, either uh, advice that I actually start to give more freely or uh, also making the point that therapists uh, generally are not helpful if they give too much advice, that the not giving of advice is actually a therapeutic stance that's worth preserving. So I'm kind of playing it, playing it both ways. Um, I structured the book around the Buddha's Noble Eightfold Path, which um, I'm going to talk about a little bit tonight. The, uh, the Eightfold Path is, the, is was the Buddha's prescription for how to implement his teachings um, in life. Uh, so it's not just about meditation, it's also about conceptual understanding and uh, uh, um, how to um, keep an eye on your own behavior. There's a big ethical component to it. So the Eightfold Path is, if I remember it properly, is uh, um, right view, right motivation, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right, right mindfulness, and right concentration. So the first two are conceptual, the next three are ethical or behavioral, and the last three are meditative. And I, in the book, I try to explain what the classic explanation of each one of those things are, but then I try to turn it and use it uh, uh, in, a, in newer ways, relating um, case material from my own life and from my patients, so how to really put it into practice in a Western psychotherapy context. So I, I thought what I would do this evening is um, give you a kind of outline of the basics of Buddhist thought, Buddhist psychology. That'll be very familiar to some of you and it'll be new to others of you, but um, I'm going to try to embellish it in various ways by, um, by reading you little bits of things that have inspired me, not necessarily my own work, but um, material that I come back to time and time again and continue to learn from. So some of it, most of it's very accessible. There's one or two things that I, I had some question about reading it to a non-clinical audience because the language is a, a little more complicated, but I think you'll probably get it fine. So 
uh, the Buddha, who seems to have been a real person, uh, although nothing was written down for three or four hundred years after he lived. He lived uh, supposedly about 2,500 years ago, maybe 2,600 years ago now, in a village uh, in what's now the border of Nepal and India. Um, and he uh, had a whole struggle for enlightenment. There's a whole myth around his upbringing. Um, I won't spend a lot of time with it, but the kind of key events uh, are the following. Uh, his mother died a week after he was born, which is something that's not ordinarily talked about that much in Buddhist circles. It's sort of like pushed away. They say, um, well, she died, but uh, he was raised by his father and his mother's sister, and he was taken care of fine. It didn't really bother him. Um, she went to a heaven realm where she was looking down on him. But I, in my last book, which was about trauma, uh, tried to make something of the fact that, you know, why is this there, that the Buddha's mother died when he was just a week old? It was kind of an introduction to uh, the... the um, uh, the kinds of traumas or sufferings that we as therapists understand can happen in those early years before we actually have a memory of anything that happened to us but where our characters or our personalities are being formed. So I think it's um, meaningful that the, uh, in this mythical story of the Buddha's life that right away they start with the loss of the mother. And when I was writing that book, I was actually uh, in the middle of another retreat at the same place where I go. And um, there's a little library in that retreat center uh, that you're not supposed to go to because you're not supposed to read or write. But I always go in, you know, like 7 o'clock in the evening to see what might happen when I go. Um, and they have a shelf there with, with like the Encyclopedia Britannica uh, worth of books that are all the Buddhist scriptures translated into English. It's about that, as big as the Encyclopedia Britannica. And there's only one place in that whole set of volumes where the death of the Buddha's mother is talked about. Uh, and I stood in front of the whole uh, shelf, picked one book at random and opened it at random, and there was the one description of the death of the Buddha's mother. So I, I, was, I felt like, oh, that's, you know, serendipity really exists. Um, so uh, the, the Buddha was raised by his father and his aunt to never see old age, illness, and death. And he got supposedly to the age of 29 without ever knowing about it until he finally slipped out of the uh, contained environment, the palace walls that he was raised in, and then on this uh, ride with his charioteer outside the walls of the palace, he of course came upon uh, an old person, uh, a sick person, and a corpse. And he was so startled and unnerved, unsettled by, the, uh, by what he saw that he decided to set out on his spiritual quest in order to uh, you know, con conquer death, basically or try to come to some freedom from the uh, impermanence uh, that faces us all. And uh, unfortunately, he left a new wife and a young son who had just been born. So he kind of sets up this uh, uh, abandonment thing where he reproduces the trauma uh, of the loss of his own mother uh, on his newborn son. But we can come back to that if anybody's interested. Um, so then he goes through a whole long struggle where he tries to subdue himself uh, according to the spiritual tradition of his time. The, his idea being that the body was bad, that passion was bad, that desire was bad, that emotion was bad, that thoughts were bad. And so he uh, basically starves himself. He becomes like a modern day anorectic patient, uh, gets down to, uh, you know, 80 pounds. Uh, and. Um, uh, is about to die from, uh, from the ascetic practices, from self-punishment. And then uh, the only time in, uh, in the whole Buddhist uh, uh, world, uh, he has a childhood memory. And uh, he remembers at the peak of his attempts to destroy himself, he remembers being a young boy sitting under a rose apple tree on a nice day with the wind blowing and his father a, a nice distance away, so not bothering him, but still visible, plowing in the fields. Uh, 
and uh, he remembers a feeling of joy that uh, came over him when he was sitting under that rose apple tree. And he thinks to himself, I think of it as the first uh, kind of uh, self-analysis in uh, literary history. He thinks to himself, why am I remembering this at this moment? You know, when I'm about to uh, uh, finally achieve my goal of eradicating, uh, you know, all of my filthy self. Why am I remembering this? And then he thinks, maybe I've been doing this all wrong. Maybe the key to the enlightenment that I'm seeking lies in this direction, the direction of the joy that I felt as a child. And then he thinks, but with a body so weak and emaciated, I could never, I could never hold that feeling of joy. You know, I'd better take some food, I'd better take some nourishment. And at that moment, of course, a young maiden appears to him holding a bowl of rice porridge and offers him the food which he takes and uh, that gives him enough strength and he walks for three days until he uh, gets to a famous tree uh, called the Bodhi tree now that he sits under and uh, wages a several day battle with his own ego uh, until he reaches his enlightenment. And um, after, his, uh, after his enlightenment, no one believes that he's enlightened. He sees a few wandering ascetics who knew him before who like brush him off because his skin is glowing and he looks too good and they think he's gone soft. Um, but finally he finds a couple of people who will listen to him and uh, then he gives his first teaching uh, and that's called turning the wheel of the Dharma. He, turn, he turns the wheel of the Dharma. There's a Sanskrit, uh, long Sanskrit name that has the word chakra in it. Chakra means wheel uh, and the whole thing means turning the wheel of the Dharma. And when he, he gives that talk, if any of you have been to India, he gives it in Sarnath, which is just outside of Benares. Uh, and there's a gigantic stupa still there that was built in the second century to commemorate this, uh, this turning of the wheel, this first teaching. Um, and uh, he taught, in this first teaching, he taught the Four Noble Truths. So the, the Four Noble Truths hold the essence of Buddhist thought, of Buddhist psychology. And, Everywhere that Buddhism has moved, even though it's been translated and retranslated and you know reformulated and accumulates all this other cultural baggage, this the Four Noble Truths uh, kind of are, that's the through line. So, and it is very psychological. And he presented them uh, to his. He had I think five wandering ascetics who were listening to him. He presented them in the form. Of, the, uh, of a medical uh, diagnosis of his time. In other words, he presented the illness, he gave the cause of the illness, he declared that there's a cure, and then he laid out the treatment. So the illness, he, he, said, he used one word for. Um, the first noble truth is really just one word, and it's dukkha. It, many of you have probably heard that word if you know about Buddhism at all. Life is dukkha, is how it's usually talked about. Dukkha conventionally in English is translated as suffering, but um, I always think that's a poor translation uh, because we think of suffering one way. He was actually saying, oh, there's plenty of happiness and joy in life, but even the happiness and joy is tinged with a sense of unsatisfactoriness. So unsatisfactoriness is probably a better translation. Why is it tinged with a sense of unsatisfactoriness? Because it doesn't last, you, you know? Um, so we always want to hold on to it a little bit longer. We always feel like, oh, we're, I'm almost, I almost have enough, but not quite. So, and then there's the other aspect of dukkha, which he discovered when he went out of the palace, old age, illness, death, separation from those we love, being forced into confinement with people that we don't love, um, et cetera, et cetera. He gives a long list of uh, you, you know, negative things that we all understand as suffering. The word that he used, dukkha, actually means hard to face. Ka is face, and du means it's like difficult, difficult to face. And there's an opposite word in Sanskrit, which is sukha, which means like uh, pleasant, pleasant to face, kind of sweetness or joy. So the Buddha is saying, 
there's, there's an aspect to life that's hard to face and that characterologically, characteristically, we, the, the ego develops defenses uh, so as not to face what's unpleasant. And the primary defense, although the Buddha didn't use this word, but the primary defense is dissociation. Uh, dissociation is a, has come into fashion now in all the talk about trauma uh, because when there's an experience of uh, what we call unbearable affect, affect meaning emotion, when there's an experience of unbearable affect, the ego, in order to protect itself, in order not to fracture uh, under the pressure of the unbearable feelings, the ego pushes what's, uh, what's uh, too hard to experience away, you know, in a kind of secret place, uh, uh, trying to just, like, forget about it. But the problem with dissociation, as we know from all the discussions of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and so on, is that uh, it won't stay away. And that, you know, either in our dreams or when we're outside and there's a little reminder that people now call a trigger, um, the, uh, the uh, bits of unbearable affect which have never been really properly digested or metabolized or, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, made peace with uh, will come and torture you. So the Buddha was on to all of this uh, early on. And um, in his second noble truth, he, uh, uh, he gave the cause. And the, the cause is, uh, it depends what level you want to hear the second noble truth on. Sometimes he just talks about the cause of dukkha as desire, which I have uh, taken issue with in my book about desire. Uh, when it's talked about that way, it's because uh, you know, in an, in an addictive personality who can never get enough, then it's obvious that your addiction, your, your desire to, you know, get more of the thing that made you feel good in the first bite or smoke or injection or whatever, it, it never does it quite uh, as well as the first time. But the, the, the uh, instinctive thing in us that wants more uh, keeps reaching for it. So in that sense, uh, desire can be a cause of dukkha. But there's, on a deeper level, the words that he used uh, are um, uh, translated variously as clinging, as craving, or as thirst. And uh, that's where he gets into a, a, a kind of deeper psychological understanding, which is that uh, we all have the tendency to uh, hold on to what's pleasant and push away what's unpleasant, and there's no way to avoid the unpleasant in the world, and uh, there's no way to hold on forever to the pleasant. So uh, that kind of clinging uh, perpetuates the unsatisfactoriness. And then there's even a third level where it's not just clinging to pl the pleasant or unpleasant, but it's also clinging to a sense of identity clinging to a sense of self. Uh, not that we don't all have a sense of self, as I was trying to tell my father, but the who we think we are is not necessarily who we actually are, as you find out when you're facing death and you have to let go of everything that you thought you were, but there's still something left. So uh, that coming to terms with how much and in what way we're all clinging to our identities is also part of the second noble truth. So, just to back up for a minute, I, I want to read to you one uh, little poem, uh, which was the first thing that I ever read uh, about Buddhism uh, in that first introduction to world religion class that I took, which is a, a chapter called Mind in a Buddhist collection uh, verse called the Dhammapada which is one of the earliest collections of Buddhist verse meant for people like us, not for monks or nuns, but for people who are living a real life in the world. And this touched me right away when I was a, a, a young man and uh, uh, still does, so um, I'm gonna read it to you. Like an archer in arrow, the wise man steadies his trembling mind. <laughs> 
a fickle and restless weapon. Flapping like a fish thrown on dry ground, it trembles all day, struggling to escape from the snares of Mara the tempter. Mara, remember, is the, uh, uh, the metaphor for the Buddha's ego, tempting him all the time. The mind is restless, to control it is good, a disciplined mind is the road to nirvana. Look to your mind, wise man, look to it well. It is subtle, invisible, treacherous. A disciplined mind is the road to nirvana. Swift, single, nebulous, it sits in the cave of the heart. Who conquers it frees himself from slavery. The mind in Buddhist psychology is both in the brain and in the heart. So it, it circulates, not just, not just localized in the brain. No point calling him wise, whose mind is unsteady, who is not serene, who does not know the Dharma. The Dharma is the kind of shorthand for the Buddha's teachings. Call him wise, whose mind is calm, whose senses are controlled, who is undisturbed by good and evil, who is wakeful. He knows the body for what it is, a frail jar. He makes his mind firm like a fortress. He attacks Mara with the weapon of wisdom. He guards what he conquers jealously. It's not long before the body, bereft of breath and feeling, lies on the ground, poor thing, like a burnt out cinder. No hate can hurt, no foe can harm, as hurts and harms a mind ill-disciplined. Neither father, mother, nor relative can help, as helps a mind that is well-disciplined. So that's, I mean, you can see why I liked it, especially as an anxious young person, like that description of the, uh, the trembling mind flapping like a fish on dry ground. Uh, uh, I felt spoke to me, but also the sense, the description of the mind, you know, I love those words, uh, swift, single, nebulous, you know, like what is that? It sits in the cave of the heart, you know, subtle, invisible, and treacherous. Um, it, it's something compelling there. Uh, the, the refrain, a disciplined mind, now that's getting into the cure, okay? so. First noble truth is dukkha, unsatisfactoriness. Second noble truth is the cause. The cause is the way we cling, okay? Um, the cause is ignorance. I ignorance about what? Ignorance about the true nature of the self. We all instinctively think the self to be something that the Buddha says it's not. The Buddha gets sort of evasive about what it is. Uh, we can get into that if we, if we want to. But he's very clear about what it's not. It's not a thing. Okay, we tend to think of it as a thing and to think of ourselves as a thing locked inside of ourselves, you know, kind of at odds with everybody else in the world. And the Buddha is uh, into undermining that, that view. So the third noble truth is there's a cure. Okay, and the cure is nirvana. Uh, a disciplined mind is the road to nirvana. Nirvana, what's nirvana? Nirvana liter literally means like the blowing out. So it's the blow what's it the blowing out of? It's the blowing out of ignorance. So the Buddha is saying, really it's only the unenlightened life that is unsatisfactory, that's suffering, that once you achieve whatever this awakening is that no one believed he had really had when he had it, uh, his first thought upon his awakening was, no one is going to believe me about this. I think I'm just going to keep quiet. Um, and then in the myth of the Buddha, the, the great god Brahma, sitting in a heaven realm, comes down to the Buddha and says, no, come on, try to talk about it. There's a few people with a little dust in their eyes who will be able to understand what you're talking about. So the Buddha relents, but he knows it's going to be hard to understand. So anyway, the, the cure is nirvana. Nirvana is the blowing out of ignorance. So it's the coming into an experience of what, say, uh, uh, um, uh, D.W. Winnicott would call your true self. Um, and then uh, the fourth noble truth uh, is, is the Eightfold Path that I already laid out for you. The fourth noble truth is the treatment. It's the way both 
uh, to awaken your mind, and it's also like the sort of roadmap for what to do once you've gotten a little glimmer of, oh, I might not be who I thought I was, how do I stay on the path? So the Eightfold Path is both the way in and the way out, if that makes any sense. Um, the best description that, that I found about what that enlightened state of mind might look like uh, came to me uh, when I was traveling in Asia um, in the late 1970s. So some years after I first met my uh, American Buddhist teachers, uh, people named Joseph Goldstein, if any of you know these, these fellows, Joseph Goldstein, Jack Kornfield, uh, a, a fellow named Richard Alpert who became Ramdas. There was a whole group of people that I met when I was quite young. And um, I traveled with them before I went to medical school to meet their various teachers, first in India and then in Burma and then in Thailand and then in Sri Lanka. And uh, while in Thailand, at a monastery up near the Lao border where uh, my friend Jack Cornfield had spent uh, two years as a celibate monk. Uh, his teacher was a forest monk uh, named Ajahn Chah. Ajahn means teacher, so his name was Cha. Um, and he was a lovely man who, uh, a couple of years after we met with him, he had a stroke and, uh, and his devotees used to carry him around, you know, because he couldn't walk anymore. But when I went to see him, he was fully functional. And um, we had a meeting with him where we asked him a question that I can't remember anymore, but basically some kind of question about, you know, what's the essence of uh, what you understand about nirvana. Um, and he answered it this way, which has stayed with me. He, um, he picked up the drinking glass that was next to him, and he held up the glass, and he said, uh, do you see this glass? I love this glass. It holds the water admirably. When the light strikes it, it makes beautiful reflections. When I hit it with my finger, it has a lovely ring. He said, but when I put the glass on the shelf and my elbow knocks it off, or the wind blows and it falls to the ground and breaks, I say, of course. But then he said, but since I know that the glass is already broken, every minute with it is precious. So I think for me, it took me a long time. I always remembered what he said, but for a long time I dwelled primarily on the glass is already broken thing, you, you know, like not to get too attached and the body's going to go and you're going to lose what, you know, the sort of depressing aspect of uh, uh, if you take Buddhism the wrong way. But then I remember, I came back to it, you know, once I know, so once he's not dissociating from or pushing away the truth of impermanence, you know, that everything breaks, you know, then every minute with it is precious, okay? Every minute is precious. Every minute that we have with our bodies, with each other, with, you know, with the high school um, is, is precious. And that that there's something about the uh, enlightened point of view there worth paying attention to. Um, so the Eightfold Path, I'm not going to go through every aspect of it, but I did structure the book around it. But I, but I want to emphasize a few things. Uh, the first is um, right view. Now, right view is a, uh, is a conceptual thing. It's a cognitive thing. There are schools of Buddhism, the, the school of uh, Tibetan Buddhism, for instance, that the Dalai Lama is the head of, the Galugpa or Yellow Hat School of Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, they don't meditate for 30, 40 years uh, uh, after they've entered the monastery. They study, study, study. You know, it's all learning. It's all like trying to get the mind into the right place where they can actually understand what the purpose and function of meditation is so that then when they finally get to the meditation, they can use it properly. They say that someone who tries to meditate uh, without a proper understanding of what the target is is like a blind man shooting archery. 
you know, with, without any, not knowing where the, where the target is at all, just shooting the arrows randomly. So a right view, right motivation, those two together make up a right understanding. Very, very important for people who want to take this seriously. Um, my friend Robert Thurman, who's a professor of Tibetan studies, professor of Buddhism at Columbia, who I sometimes have been lucky enough to teach with, he tells a story about his Mongolian Buddhist teacher who taught him in the 1960s in New Jersey, uh, who he loved, who used to say to him, you know, it's about the Buddhist idea of emptiness and non-self and so on. He used to say, it, it's not that you don't have a self. Of course you have a self. You, you know, you have a real self, but the problem with people like you is you think yourselves are really real. You know, so the uh, right in right view, you're like you're trying to um, uh, uh, scrape away, whittle away that. Where does that feeling of really real? You know, where does it come from in you? Like, how do you experience it? You want to you want to find once you get ex some facility with meditation, it stops being about paying attention to the breath or paying attention to a mantra or trying to quiet your mind. It becomes a search for the way that you take yourself too seriously. Okay, like how does the self that you cling to, how does it actually appear? So in order to understand selflessness, which is a fundamental Buddhist concept, in order to understand selflessness, you first have to find the self that you take to be really real. And they have a bunch of interesting meditations, a bunch of ways of provoking that. Uh, one of them has to do with the experience of, uh, of what they call injured innocence. When someone who you really care about, someone who you love, whose opinion about you matters, accuses you of doing something that you didn't do, blames you for something, and inside of you, you, what you, you were saying, that's not, you know, I didn't do that, you know. How can you accuse me of that? And they, what they say is that the sense of self, the self that doesn't exist, becomes most apparent to you at those times of injured innocence when you're accused of doing something by someone you love. So instead of getting mad and, you know, staying up all night trying to process whatever the thing is, to get the person to understand it the way you understand it so that they can forgive you, uh, the Buddhist way is to use those opportunities to, uh, uh, to find that bit of self and then to explore it meditatively. Because what do you find? What is it actually made of, you know, as you investigate it, as you take it apart? The, the kind of meditation that I'm most familiar with is called vipassana, um, which means insight. But uh, the word vipassana, when you take the word vipassana apart, it means to take something apart. And it means to dissect. So uh, what you're doing in meditation is taking apart your experience in order to see the way if you take an atom apart, you know, an atom is is real, but then when you, when you investigate further, it starts to be all probability and potential. You know, you can't actually put your finger on an electron. It becomes like that. Um, this is the piece that I was a little worried about reading, but I'm going to read it anyway. Um, this is from a, a, a British child psychoanalyst named Adam Phillips, who some of you might know his most famous book, is a biography of Winnicott that's just called Winnicott. And then he has another well-known book called On Kissing, Tickling, and Being Bored, which I think is a classic. Um, but this is from a book called Missing Out. Um, and uh, I, I think about it in terms of the Buddha's uh, uh, right motivation, the second limb of the Eightfold Path. Uh, thinking about it psychologically, like what's the motivation for therapy? What's the motive? What are we trying to get out of therapy? And, and I think in his own, you'll see Adam Phillips is, uh, I, I find him a wonderful writer, but he writes elliptically. So he circles something. And um, uh, this is about, um, he has a chapter on not getting it. Uh, um, so you'll see what he means. But try to listen to it as if 
well, you'll see. Not getting it might be described here as a determined, tenacious ignorance that is in the service of something better, something better than complicity, not an innocence or a faux naivete, but a belief, for example, that in some situations, not getting it is more revealing and getting it is more obscuring, that we can be fobbed off by satisfactions of getting it and oddly enlivened by the perplexity of not getting it. So there's a whole thing in Zen Buddhism about the great doubt. I think he's sort of, he's not really Buddhist, Adam, but uh, I think he's talking about what the Buddhists might uh, also be talking about, about encouraging doubt rather than being so certain about uh, um, who we are. From this perspective, says Adam Phillips, you could say, for example, if you understand why you are the person you are, oh, let me say that again. From this perspective, you could say, for example, if you understand why you are with the person you are with, then you are not really with them. You could say that the belief that there are consensual objects of desire is an anxiety about objects of desire, about the unfathomable idiosyncrasy of desiring, or an anxiety about there not being any objects of desire. And you could also say, perhaps less obviously, that if you want to be with someone who gets you, you prefer collusion, a good word these days, you prefer collusion to desire, safety to excitement, sometimes good things to prefer, but not always the things most wanted. We have been taught to wish for it, but the wish to be understood may be our most vengeful demand, may be the way we hang on as adults to our grudge against our mothers, the way we never let our mothers off the hook for their not meeting our every need. Wanting to be understood as adults can be, among many other things, our most violent form of nostalgia. I love that, our most violent form of nostalgia. But uh, you can see the relevance to the Buddha's second noble truth, okay, to the clinging or craving or desire, you know, the desire to be understood, the desire to finally make that thing with the mother, you, you know, come, uh, come clean. He goes on. Sometimes when I read this, I read a lot more of Adam, but I'll just read you the last part. He's talking about Freud here, but he could just as well be talking about Buddha, I think. It is not an increase in self-knowledge that Freud describes, but its limits. He tells us a story about the need to grow out of a need for understanding and being understood. The child needs his parents to get him, to be sufficiently attentive to his needs and fears, and then he needs to be weaned of this. Understanding first, by definition, within reason, then the freedom to also not understand or need to. Psychoanalysis is, in fact, the treatment that weans people from their compulsion to understand and be understood. It is an after education in not getting it. Through understanding to the limits of understanding, this is Freud's new version of an old project. Freud's work is best read as a long elegy for the intelligibility of our lives. We make sense of our lives in order to be free, not to have to make sense. Something very Buddhist in all of that. Now, right speech, Right speech conventionally, uh, in, you know, in the, uh, uh, when it was presented to the monks and nuns and so on, was about uh, not engaging in gossip, not uh, saying nasty things about other people, not talking tritely, you know, saying only what's meaningful. But um, uh, I've tried to take right speech and turn it inwards because I think the way we speak to ourselves under our breath 
uh, is uh, 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 equally important, if not more important, and certainly comes up in the psychotherapy office. Um, so many people uh, uh, have a um, repetitive refrain of uh, either self-judgment or uh, judgment of others that they're formulating repetitively uh, in their thinking mind. And uh, a lot of the time, we don't pay attention to that. Uh, or we don't really know what's going on, even if we do sort of pay attention to it, and we never think that there's something that we could do about it. But that again, those judgmental thoughts are wonderful objects of meditation. So in meditation, especially when we're doing mindfulness meditation, which is not about concentrating the mind on a single object, but about allowing whatever is happening to unfold within the theater of our minds, we can see all of those judgments. And that's often the big revelation on a first retreat, is to see how much time is spent uh, judging oneself or judging somebody else. But, um, the, uh, and also seeing how repetitive those thoughts are. So once you catch on to, uh, oh, it's just a refrain, then you can learn to kind of see the transparency of the thoughts so that instead of uh, focusing on the content, you start to focus just on the inflection of the thoughts. And uh, lo and behold, they tend to die down. Um, in my book, I make a big deal out of uh, a friend of mine, Sharon Salzberg, who's another one of the meditation teachers who. Uh, have been in my life for a long time. Uh, she wrote a wonderful book, one of the first books she ever wrote, which was just called Faith. Uh, Sharon Salzberg is her name. And in that book, she's the most revealing about her own uh, uh, individual psychology um, of any Buddhist teacher that I know. And uh, you'll see what, I'm gonna read you a little bit from her book and you'll, you'll see why. This is in terms of right speech. She begins the book with this. Each of us tells ourselves some kind of story about who we are and what our life is about. As is the case for many, the story I told myself for years was that I didn't deserve to be happy. Throughout my childhood, I believed that something must be intrinsically, intrinsically wrong with me because things never seemed to change for the better. My father, whom I adored, disappeared when I was four, and my mother and I moved in with my, aunt and, with my aunt and uncle. One night, when I was nine years old, my mother and I were home alone. She had recently undergone surgery and seemed to be recovering well. In celebration of her return, I was wearing my ballerina Halloween costume. We were sitting close together on the couch, watching her favorite singer, Nat King Cole, on television, when suddenly she began bleeding violently. I ran out into the hallway to get someone to help us but couldn't find anyone. My mother managed to tell me to call an ambulance immediately and then to call my grandmother, whom I hardly knew, to come and get me. Shaking uncontrollably, I complied. After that evening, I never saw her again. About two weeks later, she died in the hospital. After that, I lived with my father's parents and rarely heard mention of my mother again. My childhood continued to unfold through terrifying, uprooting turns and incomprehensible losses. When I was 11, my grandfather died, and one day my father returned. The handsome prince I'd secretly imagined had been replaced by a disheveled, hard-bitten, troubled stranger. Six weeks later, he took an overdose of sleeping pills. That night, my father entered the mental health system and was never able to function outside of it again. One of the hardest parts of all of the loss and dislocation was that it was surrounded by an ambient, opaque silence about what was happening. Because no one spoke openly or even acknowledged all the changes as loss, my immense grief, anger, and confusion remained held inside. Whenever the cover slipped, I scrambled to hide the feelings or distort them 
so that no one would really know, especially not myself. So here you can see, this is what I was talking about at the beginning about dissociation and the dukkha, the suffering that's part of life, that the people's reaction, either Sharon's as a child or her family, is trying to protect her, much like the Buddha's family, you know, like let's just not talk about it. And I've heard that over and over again. A friend of mine whose mother killed herself when he was a young boy, father came down the next day, no one ever talked about her again. You know, like that, it's just so hard and people don't know how to do it. They're not doing it to be punishing, they just really don't know how. And doctors are as bad when it comes to, uh, you know, malignant cancers and so on. Um, they, uh, you know, they only want to talk about the hope but not about the reality. Sharon goes on. The story I was telling myself was that what I felt didn't matter anyway. Feeling so different, I liked playing it safe more than anything. Seeing life from a distance, never really engaging, preferring to lose myself in the seductive play of listlessness. I didn't care about anything, or so I hoped it seemed. I came to know very well the protection of distance, of a narrow, compressed world. Though it was my own act of pulling back, I felt forsaken. I told myself a story that there was no way out of the world that turned me in upon myself. Years later, as an adult, I would find the phrase that perfectly described my dilemma. Some friends and I had rented a house near the ocean where we could practice meditation on our own for a few days. In my designated bedroom, I found a Peanuts comic strip on the desk, which went something like this. Lucy is sitting in a little booth. A doctor is in sign prominently displayed. She tells Charlie Brown, you know what your problem is, Charlie Brown? The problem with you is that you're you. Crush, Charlie Brown asks, well, what in the world can I do about that? Lucy responds in the final frame, I don't pretend to be able to give advice. I merely point out the problem. In fact, Sharon says, until I was 18, Lucy ruled. My resistance to participating more fully in life came to feel like the most alive, vibrant thing about me. I often found myself in many endeavors not really trying because I was secretly sure that I'd fail. I'd learned well enough to hold life in abeyance. For years, I hardly spoke. I barely allowed myself a full-blown emotion. No anger, no joy. My whole life was an effort to balance on the edge of what felt like an eroding cliff where I was stranded. I was waiting, suspended. I once asked a psychiatrist friend what he considered the single most compelling force for healing in the psychotherapeutic relationship. Love, he replied. I agreed with him about the transforming power of love, but wondered if there wasn't something else even more fundamental. For all we know, I suggested, what's, more, what's most important to healing and therapy is that people show up for their appointments. The therapist's love can nurture healing, but it's our own faith in that possibility that impels us to show up and take each new step into the darkness. To see such possibility for myself, I first had to reach within the lassitude coiled tightly around my heart and begin transforming how I felt about my heart and about myself. I had to give up my protective distance, alter my habit of withdrawal, and learn to participate, engage, and link up. I had to acknowledge that underneath my facade of indifference, I cared, and in fact cared a lot. I cared about what happened to me and what happened to others. I cared about life. So Sharon, like me, was lucky enough to find Buddhism early and uh, the teachers that she found, the relationships that that nurtured, and also the practice really allowed her to be able to write something like that, you know, to see how constrained she had become as a result of circumstances she had no control over, how she blamed herself for them, and then, but then how they didn't have to define her. And, uh, and I think in terms of bringing a Buddhist view into a, um, a psychotherapeutic relationship, uh, she's, she's describing that very, very well. <clears throat> 
Um, kind of in that vein, do, do any of you know the poet Louise Gluck? The, she's a wonderful poet, and some years ago there was a, um, a big long piece in the New Yorker about her that I, that I cut out. She was uh, anorectic as a young girl, and uh, what she describes, I think, goes along with what Sharon described uh, and uh, plays back to the Buddha's life history and maybe relate. You know, there are many different ways that uh, our lives take us, but, and these are some of the more severe ways that people shut down on themselves. But I don't think that they're extraordinary. I think that uh, many people uh, uh, shut themselves down in one way or another. And the opening up process really does have to do with uh, establishing a different uh, uh, point of view within one's own mind. So what I'm hoping to do, I want to finish with this bit of uh, material from Louise Gluck, and then if it's okay with everyone, lead you in a little bit of meditation, and then uh, take some questions, if that seems okay. So, uh, Louise Gluck, just to give you a little history, was born in 1943 in New York City and raised in, on Long Island. A sister died before Gluck was born. Her death was not my experience, she says, but her absence was. Her death let me be born. That severity of judgment, the writer here says, is typical of Gluck, who often pairs experience down to brutal cause and effect. Gluck sought her mother's approval exclusively, approval that was usually withheld. Her father, who had helped bring the X-Acto knife to market, was a worldly success with buried literary ambitions. A younger sister appears in Gluck's poems, sometimes as ally, often as rival. Much of life for Gluck is livable only when hostile factions lay aside their arms. It is a view of social life as driven not by altruism, but by truce, and it was formed in that home. When she was 16, Gluck, suffering from anorexia, nearly starved herself to death. Her formal, her formal schooling was sporadic from that moment forward. She spent seven years in psychoanalysis and eventually apprenticed herself to two poets, first Leonie Adams, then Stanley Kunitz, both of whom she met during a brief period at Columbia. Anorexia seems to have been a clumsy early form of writing poetry, focusing exclusively and therefore tragically on form, on the body. Analysis, which replaced anorexia by describing it, would then be an improvement, except that it had no form. Its truths were inert and abstract. Only in poetry could the formal manifestations of insight be explored, a fact that she explores in form in a section of a poem, Dedication to Hunger. I'll read you just a bit from that. It begins quietly in certain female children the fear of death, taking as its form dedication to hunger. Because a woman's body is a grave, it will accept anything. I remember lying in bed at night, touching the soft, digressive breasts, touching at 15 the interfering flesh that I would sacrifice until the limbs were free of blossom and subterfuge. I felt what I feel now aligning these words. It is the same need to perfect of which death is a mere byproduct. Blossom, says the writer, is what grown-ups say that girls' bodies do. To the girls, it feels more like subterfuge. That pair of words reveals so much about what drove Gluck in poems like this one the need to perfect, certainly, but what poet doesn't feel some version of that need? Gluck's provocative difference was to link perfection with forms of defiance, as she writes in another poem, Education of the Poet. This is an essay, actually, not a poem. By the time I was 16, a number of things were clear to me. 
It was clear that what I had thought of as an act of will, an act I was perfectly capable of controlling, of terminating, was not that. I realized that I had no control over this behavior at all, and I realized logically that to be 85, then 80, then 75 pounds was to be thin. I understood that at some point I was going to die. Even then, dying seemed like a pathetic metaphor for establishing a separation between myself and my mother. She writes about her mother in this poem. She was buoyant by nature. She wanted to travel, go to theater, go to museums. What he wanted was to lie on the couch with the times over his face so that death, when it came, wouldn't seem a significant change. And then just a couple that, that they end the piece with. Um, she writes about being a child with her sister playing a game of family. I was the man, I was the man, she writes, because I was taller. My sister decided when we should eat. From time to time, she'd have a baby. <laughs> and then, uh, I had a dream my mother fell out of a tree. After she fell, the tree died. It had outlived its function. And then, but she, in a later poem, written more when this article was written, uh, the author says she makes the most unlikely truce of all. My body, now that we will not be traveling together much longer, I begin to feel a new tenderness toward you, very raw and unfamiliar, like what I remember of love when I was young. So that sense of making a truce with your body or a truce with your mind, a truce with your history, uh, with your judgments, with your longings, that, that's really what I see meditation as being about and how I see it dovetailing or interacting with what we do in psychotherapy. So if you're, um, if you're open to it, we could we could do a little bit of that right here, right now. Um, I can instruct you, those of you who need instruction, probably a lot of you already have a meditation practice, uh, just for five minutes or so. And uh, if you're not comfortable with it, if you don't want to, you can just like take a little rest. Uh, but if you, uh, if you take a meditative posture, which is basically to sit comfortably, but with your back as uh, uh, comfortably straight as you can, letting your arms rest in your lap and your feet rest on the floor and your eyes close. You can keep your eyes open if you'd rather, but let them gaze downward if you do. But closing them is fine. And then the, the basic instruction is to rest your mind in the body the way your body is resting in the chair. So a sense of settling. Settling the body, feeling how it's being held, settling the mind, active though it may be. and just opening your senses, opening your ears to the sound of the auditorium and my voice. Opening your skin, your nerves, to the subtle sensations, vibrations, feelings, pleasant or unpleasant or neutral as you're sitting. Opening your visual field, even if your eyes are closed, to the play of light and dark, color. Noticing the mind the intellect, how it wants to identify what it is you're experiencing, comment, 
on how you're doing. Thinking random thoughts about past and future. Don't try to stop any of it. Experience yourself here moving as you are through time. Paying attention especially to how your experience is changing moment to moment. Follow, if you can, the thread of your own consciousness. Aware first of one thing, then of another. Sometimes even aware of itself, like a dog chasing its own tail, consciousness, conscious of its own awareness. Difficult as that is to describe. Let your mind be open as if it were a vast sky. Sometimes empty, blue, shining, sometimes filled with clouds, stars, wind, rain, fog in Chicago. Trying as much as possible just to be here simply with the way things are, moment to moment. Pay particular attention to that little voice that you know or that you think of as you, commenting, maybe even judging, maybe even wondering how long we're going to do this for. Try to observe that manifestation as if from the corner of your mind, like you've set up a kind of spy consciousness, eavesdropping on yourself. So that you don't completely buy into whatever your thoughts are saying. If your mind is quiet, that's fine. There's plenty still to pay attention to. Just be with it as it changes. 
And if I had a little bell, I would ring it to bring you out. So that's, a, that's an example of where, where mindfulness meditation can go, where we're no longer you know, uh, trying to quiet the mind, but we're just making room, making room for everything to be as it is. And that, uh, that kind of meditation practice for a while is, is, becomes very revealing. Thank you. Stand up to ask your question. Keep the microphone close to you. Uh, th thank you for your presentation. And I, I had a question. Um, it's really my first, I guess, introduction to Buddhism, if you will. So I'm wondering, is it kind of more of a traditional or classic religion? Or does it kind of allow for entrance of other religion? Um, for example, I'm assuming in your case, Judaism. but. I don't know why you would assume that. <laughs> um, you could all hear the question, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I always think of Buddhism as the most psychological of the world's religions and the most spiritual of the world's psychologies. That, that's, that's how I think of it. Um, but I think, you, you know, unfortunately, if you look at what's happening, say, in Burma, where the Buddhists are, you know, um, ethnically cleansing the, the Rohingya people. There, it, it's, uh, I don't even know if you would call that a religion or if you would call it a, you know, clan-based uh, ideology. Uh, it certainly is a religion, has become a religion in many of the cultures where it has taken root. And at the same time, there are people who within the religion of it would uh, try to free themselves of the, uh, um, the uh, uh, religious aspects in order to get to the essence of it. So I think in, in Buddhism coming to the West, we have a chance to re-examine it and kind of free it from its cultural context and let it re-establish itself. And there's a lot of argument uh, among Buddhists about uh, uh, how much to let go of the Asian cultures that, uh, of their interpretation of it uh, and how much to uh, continue to uh, see it as a religion. Um, the, the Dalai Lama, uh, when he talks about it, always says, no, 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 don't leave the religion of your origin. If you find something useful in that religion, don't become a Buddhist. Just take what's helpful from Buddhism and use it. And that, but he does that a lot of sort of false disclaimer because there he is actually propagating Buddhism, you know. But I think in a way he believes that it it fits very nicely. Um, with there are there are many people who still identify themselves as Jewish or Christian or Hindu or Islamic, whatever but a draw from Buddhism what's helpful. I think there are many other people. Now, if, when people ask me, are you a Buddhist? I say, yes, I'm a Buddhist. But um, my children were bar mitzvahed, you know, so. Uh, uh. Let me see, Susan, do you have someone on your side? Otherwise, I'll take this nice lady. If you could stand up real quick. Keep the phone on, so. Hi, thank you for this evening's chat. I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about um, your conversation with your father about death and how you helped him to um, move through that experience without fear and talking about, um, you know, possibly the body as just the shell of the spirit or soul. Could you all hear? Um, well, I wish I had been able to help my father more move through death. Uh, the conversation I described to you was the conversation that I had with him. Uh, um, so w whether that helped him or not, um, I don't know. Uh, I hope that it did. W my favorite line about death is that uh, death is like taking off a tight shoe. Uh, so I think that that relationship, you know, if, if, you're, you can entertain the possibility of consciousness 
uh, continuing in some form, which obviously we don't know whether it does or not, and our, our, um, the neuroscientists um, uh, are pretty sure that it doesn't. But if you can entertain the possibility that it might, and if you have practiced in this way uh, meditatively to uh, not align yourself either for or against the pleasant or the unpleasant, but to develop a vast uh, equanimity uh, um, towards all things, then you can imagine a process like death that one could travel through with that kind of equanimity. And so that's the vision, that's the vision of uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, et cetera. That once you have trained your mind, like I was reading from the Dhammapada, you know, death comes so quickly, you know, you think you've got a whole life ahead of you, but turn around and it's gone, you know. Um, and, uh, but to be able to go into even that experience optimistically, like there's something I can do here. And I always think of it as it's sort of like, must be sort of like a dream. Like when you're in your dream body, when you're dreaming at night, you know, like you're still you, you, you know, but you're not in the body anymore, but you're, kind of, you're floating, you're moving through all these weird experiences. You know, sometimes we get terrified and we, I wake up, you know, all, so uh, that, I'm sure that happens in death also. We, I tell a story in the, in the book, uh, a comforting story for me, um, of a, uh, a very respected Buddhist practitioner who, uh, coming out of a three-year retreat, discovered that he had colon cancer that had already progressed and uh, moved in with a, a student of his who took care of him. And the student who took care of him reported to me years later that his dying words, his last words were, no, 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 help, help. And she was all disturbed that such a practiced uh, a meditator would uh, be reacting like that at the time of death. And I tried to uh, see it a different way, which was, you know, maybe he was just really experiencing his own truth then and was as open to it as he could be. So there are many stories of people passing through that doorway peacefully, but I don't think we have to lay a trip on ourselves even up to the point of death where we have to do it a certain way because we have about as much control over that as we do in our dreams. They, they do say to go towards the uh, go towards the brightest light and the loudest sound uh, when you're dying, not to shrink away from them. That go towards the light. Hi, um, I'm a high school student, and I've noticed that mindfulness practice has become somewhat of almost a trend. I think in um, young people, and I was wondering if you think that um, that kind of simplistic mindfulness practice can still have benefits even as it's like a popular thing or if that kind of distorts the, the purpose in your thinking or somewhere in between. Yeah. You could all hear. Um, I don't think it matters if it's a trend or not a trend um, other than, <coughs> excuse me, if people have too many expectations for mindfulness, I sometimes compare it to um, when, when Prozac came out and uh, Prozac really helped some people a lot, a lot, a lot, but it didn't do anything for a lot of other people who really wished that it was gonna change their lives. There's a little bit of that in the uh, contemporary embrace of mindfulness. Mindfulness is hard, and it, it really is something. It's not just a placebo. Um, it really does something if you work at it, uh, it doesn't do anything if you don't work at it, you, you know, and it might, doesn't always do something even if you do work at it, you know. Um, but if you take to it, then I think mindfulness presented even without any Buddhist, anything around it, just by itself, it, uh, it opens a lot of doors. 
um, because it's a real, it's a real discipline. You, you know, it really is a way to get a handle on your own mind. And uh, that can be a great thing to have in your pocket. So for a little while I was worried because I, you, you know, I found it when I was 18, 19 years old and um, I would always be, every retreat I went to and so on, I would always be the youngest person on the retreat up until into my 60s, I was still the youngest person. And, uh, uh, but now, now it's like uh, uh, creeping into the general culture, which is, uh, you know, I think hopefully a good thing. Uh, but it probably it'll fade out, you know, some, something else will take its place. Okay, this will be our last question right here. If you could stand up now. Oh, it seems like so much pressure. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, it's kind of an ironic question, but with our lives being so busy and high speed, how do you start to work some kind of mindfulness meditation into your life, I guess? Yeah. Um, people make a big deal about how high pressure and high speed our lives are now, uh, you know, complicated by digital life and cell phones and everything. I have a feeling there's always been a, a, a high speed and pressure to life, uh, even going way back. Um, uh, so, I think it's wonderful, like uh, the way I've tried to go on retreat every year since my kids got old enough to be able to take a week or two weeks uh, and drop everything and go away to a monastery, you know, or to a retreat center and just practice. I mean, that is a true gift that you can give to yourself. That's a real spa experience for the mind. And it reveals what meditation is capable of doing. At the same time, I really believe that the point of it all is to be able to live a high-pressured, busy life, uh, uh, experiencing every moment of it as precious. Uh, and that it's just as possible to do that in a busy life, or it's just as, as, as in a slow down one, and it's just as difficult to do it in a busy life as it is on a meditation retreat. Um, so I think that's where the practice you know, it's not just sitting in silent meditation for X number of minutes, you know, X times a day. It's really being able to keep an eye on yourself. That's why my, this book, you know, I, um, A Guide to Getting Over Yourself, being conscious of the way your ego is trying to control everything in a busy life, you know, and it can't. It can control some things, a lot of things, which is great. But when it can't, that's where we start to uh, struggle. And so being aware of that struggle and relaxing in the midst of it, that's as much a meditation as sitting on a cushion and watching your breath. So I think that to be able to deploy it in that environment m makes it meaningful. Everyone, let's please thank Dr. Epstein. Thank you. Thank you all. Really appreciate it.